Hi, I'm Pastor David Wendell. This is my sermon for the 24th Sunday after Pentecost, November 12th, 2023, which will be preached at Shepherd of the Woods Lutheran Church, Jacksonville, Florida. The first lesson is Amos chapter 5, verses 18 to 24. The second lesson is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. And the gospel lesson for this Sunday is from the gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter, verses 1 through 13. Jesus said, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be compared to ten maidens who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those maidens rose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, Perhaps there will not be enough for us and for you. Go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other maidens came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. This is the Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As you may or may not know, I resigned my full-time position on the executive staff of the North American Lutheran Church and have accepted a call to be senior pastor of Grace Lutheran Church in Westerville, Ohio. After 12 years of almost constant travel and time away from home, Susan and I have become convinced that God is calling us back to parish ministry, which has always been my first love in ministry, serving a local congregation. I've done all I could to build up all the congregations of the NALC. Now it seems God's calling me to focus once again on one congregation as pastor and shepherd. My official end date was the end of September, <clears throat> but we agreed that I would fulfill my commitment through the end of the year to the four congregations who had scheduled Fresh Eyes for Mission Summit, which I, Summits, which I developed and, and I've been facilitating these last two or three years, which will make 35 congregations where I've helped them look with fresh eyes at their current reality and their capacity for mission to help them see and move into God's intended future for their mission and ministry. And as I've now worked with so many congregations, people invariably ask, what commonalities have you found? What have you learned? And I'll tell you this. What most have in common, what I've learned is a theme running through most every NALC congregation, is that we often seem to be asleep on the job. We are asleep at the wheel. Folks will describe it in different ways, but that's what they mean. Some will say, Pastor, we've become complacent in our faith. Others will say, it seems we've stopped trying. Still others will say, it seems we're on autopilot. And I've heard that from congregations and pastors and individual church members, some of whom blame it on burnout, while others explain that it's from lack of vision and focus, while there are some who honestly say, 
I'm just tired and I can't push anymore. And there's a part of me that hears that with compassion and wants to say, sure, I hear you. Take a breath, take a break, sit back and relax. Well, there's another part of me that hears Jesus in our gospel lesson for this Sunday and wonders, are we the ones Jesus is speaking to when he says, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the bridegroom will return. Are we the ones the Lord is warning with the parable of the wise and foolish bridesmaids, encouraging us to wake up, to watch, to be prepared for the bridegroom whenever he comes? It's interesting that this message this warning remains as timely today as it was when Jesus first told that parable before his crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. More than 2,000 years ago, the Lord had been speaking with his disciples then about the coming day of the Lord, a day of wrath and judgment. In chapter 24 of Matthew's Gospel, just before our reading today, in chapter 25, Jesus had been speaking with his followers about the time that would come. When the temple in Jerusalem would be destroyed, when not one stone would be left upon another. So naturally, they asked, tell us, when will this be and what will be the sign of your coming at the close of the age? So Jesus goes on telling them, Take heed that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes. All this is but the beginning of the sufferings. Oh, so this will be just the beginning of the sufferings. The Lord goes on to say, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise, and because wickedness is multiplied, most men's love will grow cold. And Jesus concludes saying, But he who endures to the end will be saved. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. It's just after, then, that Jesus speaks of the coming of the Son of Man, when he will return and all the tribes and peoples of the earth will see him coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. But he who endures to the end will be saved. But he who endures to the end will be saved. In the next chapter, Jesus tells his followers then and now what it means to endure to the end. How to endure to the end as he shares the parable of the five wise and five foolish bridesmaids. In years past, I've preached on this text and explained ancient Near Eastern wedding customs and how it was that the bridegroom would usually be delayed so that everyone knew that the bridesmaids waiting must prepare themselves with enough oil for their lamps and even more than enough to be ready when the bridegroom would come. But apart from wedding customs and lamps and oil, I think Jesus' point is clear, and it's as clear today as it was for the first disciples when they heard it in Jerusalem. 
And the point is, Jesus will come again. There will be a day of the Lord. No one knows the day or the hour, but only the Father and the Son whom he sent. And those who remain awake and watchful, watchful, those who endure to the end, will be saved. That's the message. But what does that mean for you and for me? Well, given what's happening in our world today, one might think, this is it. Wars between Russia and Ukraine, an apocalyptic upheaval in the Holy Land, hatred and false teaching and people turning away from God, natural disasters. The Lord clearly states, these are signs. But truly, signs such as these have been with us from the time when Jesus walked the earth in the first century. They are signs, and they are intended to be signs to remind us that there will be a day of the Lord. God gives us such signs to keep us awake and aware of the reality that this will not go on forever. While no one knows the day or the time, we need only look around us to remember the words of the prophets and the Lord himself, that the Son of Man will return, and it is for us to endure until that time when he comes again. So what does the Lord mean when he says, those who endure will be saved? What does he mean when he, he encourages us to keep enough oil for our lamps until he, the bridegroom, comes? Well, today he says, watch. Today the Lord is saying, don't let your oil run out and the lamp of your life burn out. Don't weary in waiting and be caught napping when the Son of Man comes. In just a couple of weeks, we'll enter the season of Advent when the call will be sounded again and again. Wake! Awake! Now is the time for faithfulness. Now is the time to stir up hearts and lives to be prepared and ready for the Advent of our God. And what will be our response? How do we rank and file Christians respond to the clarion call? Sadly, the usual response is, ho oh, hum. We've heard it so many times before that we hit the snooze button and go back to sleep. We hear it every year in the weeks between All Saints Sunday and the Festival of Christ the King. And we hear it pretty much every Sunday in Advent. Wake! Awake! Now is the time. Now is the day of salvation. Jesus the Lord is calling us to be awake and attentive. But as we said most Lutheran congregations and maybe most Lutherans are asleep at the wheel, flying on autopilot. It's just been so long since Jesus ascended. So long since the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. So long we've been waiting and watching and trying to be prepared and ready. But we're busy and we get tired. There's so much to do in life and in the church so that we're sometimes worn out and sometimes not really attentive to our spiritual lives. Sometime I'll get fired up. Sometime I'll get more engaged. In a little while, I'll get up and get busy about the things of the kingdom of God. It seems there's plenty of time. It seems the day of the Lord, the return of the Son of Man, isn't now or soon. So why get worked up about it now? Why wake and watch now? 
today, right now? Because no one knows the day or the hour. Because the one who endures will be saved. Because the Lord calls us not to a sleepy, lukewarm, autopilot kind of following. Because the Lord calls us to respond to his presence and his word by lives of faith and love. From the time that Jesus first told the parable of the wise and foolish maidens, people have been discussing and debating, what is the oil? If we're to keep enough oil to keep the lamps of our lives burning brightly until Jesus comes again, what is that oil and how do we keep it replenished? Martin Luther thought that the oil is faith. Some scholars have questioned that because if faith is a gift, then it's not up to us to keep filled with faith. St. Augustine believed and wrote about this parable that love is the oil. Augustine said, it is, of course, some great thing, some exceedingly great thing that this oil signifies. Do you think it might be love, Augustine asks? I will tell you why love seems to be signified by the oil, Augustine says. He writes, the apostle says, I will show you a still more excellent way. If I speak with the tongue of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. This love, it is that way that is above the rest, which is, with good reason, signified by the oil. So first, writes Augustine, the oil signifies love. But what of the lamps? What's the meaning of putting oil in your lamp? Augustine continues to explain that putting oil in your lamps means having love in your heart. There is the oil, Augustine says, the precious oil. This oil is the gift of God. We can put olive oil into our lamps, but we ourselves cannot create the olive. See, Augustine says, I have oil, but I, did I create the oil? It is the gift of God. So carry it with you, Augustine says. Have it within where it's pleasing to God. So Luther thought the oil was faith, whereas Augustine spoke of the oil as love, and the lamp is your heart. Both of these explanations are helpful. Interesting that those are two of the three greatest gifts of the Holy Spirit, faith and love. So I say, why not add hope? Faith and love are both gifts of God given through the Holy Spirit, which then lead to, which inspire hope. Isn't that how we endure and so are saved? Isn't that what it means to respond to God's gift of his only begotten son, Jesus, and his death and resurrection by living with faith and love, which gives us and others hope? St. Paul says in our second reading for today, I don't want you to live as those who have no hope which is why God gives us the gift of forgiveness, life, and salvation, which creates in us the response of faith and trust in him. It's why God so loves us through his son that we are awakened and stirred to love one another. And that's why we have hope 
Because every day, every day we awake, aware of the good news of abundant life and eternal life. Because every day we are awakened to the hope that is in us because Jesus, who was dead, is alive and we are alive in him. We will live in him and with him forever. So we are awake and we watch. We endure as God fills our hearts and lives with faith and love and hope. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.